Hi, thanks for listening to our sermon podcast, Second on the Mount. I'm George Anderson, minister at Second Presbyterian in Roanoke, Virginia. I do not take it for granted that people sit in the pews on Sunday morning or listen to these podcasts hoping to hear something that connects them to God, to each other, to the world. And so I spend hours seeking the right word for the right time and said in the right way. I welcome your feedback. I encourage your sharing this sermon with anyone it might benefit. And I hope you'll return to this podcast again or come visit us for worship. We'd be happy to have you. Let's pray. Holy God, if there is anything said from this pulpit that is not according to your will, let it come to naught and do no harm. But if there is anything said that is according to your will, let it be heard as if sung by the voice of angels, that hearing we might believe and believing obey. Amen. I cannot remember the student, but I talked to someone involved in a program where honor students in the U.S. and honor students in Ukraine engaged in this semester-long cross-cultural project that had something to do with world issues and leadership. This is what I remember. The war was in its early stages. Russia had invaded and cities were being bombed with residences often being the target. But this did not stop the Ukrainian students from their project. One of their virtual get-togethers was held during a blackout. The Ukrainian students were gathered in a home in Kiev and were sitting in the dark with flashlights. You could hear explosions in the distance as they discussed their readings, shared their research, and even laughed a little. Those Ukrainian students were trying to stay out of harm's way, but there was schoolwork to do. They went on with the business of life, even under threat and with so much uncertainty about their future, there was schoolwork to do. It had to be done if they were going to complete the project. And doing it helped carry them through. Our passage this morning has similar dynamics. It tells of a large gathering in a room. The disciples are among them. So too is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Other women are there. They are the earliest church. They followed Jesus when he was alive, and they have been with Jesus after he rose from the grave. And the risen Jesus told them to carry on the movement, to make a witness. But he's gone now, and they don't know what the future holds. But there's work to do, maybe because it needs to be done, and maybe because it's what carries them. Listen. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John, and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. And in those days, Peter stood up among the brothers and sisters. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us, and was allotted his share in our ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. This became known to all the residents of Jerusalem, so that the field where he was and where he laid was called in their language, Hakeldama, that is the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let this house become desolate and let no one live in it and let another take his place as overseer. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that Jesus was with us and who went in and out among us, beginning from practically the time when John baptized him, one of these must become a witness with us to the resurrection. 
So they proposed two. Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justice, and also Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen and take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lots fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven disciples. The word of the Lord. The future is far from certain, and the world seems threatening. This is the earliest church that's gathered here, and Jesus wants this earliest church to make a witness beginning in Jerusalem. But who's going to listen to them? The church already has been discredited in Jerusalem on multiple levels. To begin with, their witness is of a living Jesus that everyone in town knows was crucified. Lies were told by powerful people, and as often happens when power puts itself to the task of persecution by propaganda, masses believed a mob joined with the powers it worked. He's dead. And who wants to upset the powers that killed him? Also, who's going to listen to these specific disciples? I mean, look at what disciples do. One of them, Judas showed what disciples are all about when his loyalty was bought. Now that's unfair, I know. But you know how people do. Name any group of people you can think of. It only takes a few seconds to come up with the name of someone representing that group, providing fodder to dismiss the whole lot of them. A football player is caught on camera hitting his girlfriend. Jocks. A politician proves to be a hypocrite or a crook. Politicians. A corporation sacrifices safety for profit. Big corporations. An older person is close-minded. A young person is foolish. Boomers. Gen Zers. Someone is going to say, that's how they all are. It's a real blow to the credibility of any group when one of its leaders has been exposed for impropriety, whether it's financial, like Judas, or another impropriety. I'll let you fill in the blank. You heard what Judas did, didn't you? I bet if you offered 30 pieces of silver to any one of them, they would have sold them out. They're all hypocrites who just want your money. It's not fair. But it is the way the world thinks. And you know what is fair? To point out that while the people in the room may not have all betrayed Jesus, they did abandon him. He's a coward can be as damning as she's a crook. And when Jesus was arrested, they fled. Uh, Now, wait a minute. Even that's not completely fair because there are women in that room who are with Jesus all the way to the cross. But still, the disciples, the leaders, fled. And chief among them was Peter, who in the courtyard outside where Jesus was being interrogated by the high priest, denied knowing him three different times. So it has to be awkward for Peter to stand up now and tell the rest of the disciples what to do, what they are now to do. I'm not saying he shouldn't do it. He should. He's been told to do it by Jesus. And it's okay inside Peter because Peter has spent time with the risen Jesus and he knows that he is forgiven. In fact, it's okay with the rest of the disciples that Peter offers guidance because they share his story. They faltered in the same way. It's certainly okay with me, nobody asked me, but it certainly is okay with me that Peter offers leadership because any minister with any measure of honesty and humility will admit to having failed in ways in which she or he has encouraged others to be faithful. I'm just saying that there is a messaging problem out there in the world. Outside this room where Jesus' followers are gathered, out there in the city of Jerusalem, people are going to think what they think. The internet is hard to scrub. Gossip cannot be answered. Reputations are hard to restore. The earliest church is going to have to do its work despite 
what everybody knows happened and what they did and where they failed, even as they go out to preach about the one that they abandoned. But they have no other choice. They've been told to do it by Jesus. Never mind that they are the ones who let Jesus down before he was crucified. They are the ones the risen Jesus chose to bear his witness. Read what Jesus said in Acts 1, 8 sometime. He told them to go out, make a witness in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to all the ends of the earth. Jerusalem. A hard place to start because everyone in Jerusalem knows everything I just told you. So who's going to listen to what they have to say? Judea. Judea is Israel at large. You know, it seemed everywhere that Jesus went when he traveled around Judea, he always was confronted and opposed by these powerful religious leaders. Well, won't they oppose his followers too? Samaria. Samaria is where border people live. They're despised by both Jews and Gentiles. And if the disciples associate with Samaritans, won't they be despised too? The ends of the earth, that's where Gentiles live. Gentiles don't buy into the Jewish law that Jesus fulfills, so why should they care about a new Israel? So this is awkward, not just for Peter, it's awkward for all of those who are gathered there, this between time for the early church. They need to do what Jesus calls them to do, even though they have been discredited in the eyes of those to whom they will go. I think American congregations can relate. In today's America, some are making fun of the church for being an institution that is interested only in its survival. Ignoring what science has to say. Preaching outdated formula theology that makes God seem like a child abuser. Having pastors, having members misbehave. Churches aligning themselves with some political figure as God's servant or using fear-based preaching to get people to join the church or using shame-based theology to manipulate people to fall in line or join a cause. Some of the criticism is unfair, even though it's true about some churches and some ministers. Some is fair, some is not. Critics can be unfair when they dismiss the whole because of its parts. But they also can be God's servants in holding communities accountable to what needs to be addressed and changed. The disciples in that room know they have to do differently. They know they messed up they're going to have to figure out that their witness is not going to be about themselves as role models, but rather about the love of God who offers grace to others just as God offered grace to them. But they need time. They need time to find the confidence and hope and courage to take this movement out into Jerusalem where they have been discredited again. As it turns out, they're not going to be ready until God's Spirit makes them ready. But the point is, it's going to take some time. So what do they do in the meantime? Well, there's work to do. Work that maybe needs to be done and work that maybe will carry them through. To begin with, they need to pray. Prayer is dismissed as avoiding responsibility sometimes, such as when people who actually can do something about a problem say instead, let's pray about it. But though prayer can be used to avoid the truth and dodge responsibility, it also can be the means by which to face the truth and deal with it. I mean, if you're a parent going through a divorce, not yet knowing how to reconstruct your life, if you are someone waiting for a diagnosis that will not be heard until the doctor says it, and that's not even until two weeks from Tuesday. Or if you're disciples who are not yet ready to walk out that door and go into Jerusalem and beyond to the ends of the earth, prayer is not nothing. Prayer is grounding oneself in God and reminding yourself that you are not alone. It is reminding oneself of God's love. It is asking to be forgiven. It's asking for the strength and character to forgive. It's seeking some guidance 
It's asking for patience while waiting for the guidance. It's listening for some truth that so far hasn't been heard. It's asking for a path forward that so far hasn't been seen. Prayer is waiting work. And there's other waiting work to be done. Now, I don't know if it's needed work or work that they need to do to carry through, but these disciples have a vacancy to fill. Jesus had 12 disciples. Now there are only 11. 12 is a good number. 12 tribes of Israel. Sticking with 11 would make it seem incomplete. It would also be forever a reminder, not only that they are one short, but why they are one short. One of them, who Jesus called a brother in the movement, betrayed Jesus for money and then took his own life. That's traumatizing. The group needs to heal. So let's find someone to replace Judas so we can at least start being whole again and we can move on. Now, when they chose Matthias, did they make the best choice? I don't know. I do want to say this. I think they made the best choice that they could. I mean, how do you replace a leader when you don't even know where to be led, when you don't know what the future holds? So one can understand why Peter gives the advice that he gives. He says, you know, let's just stick with who we know. He says, let's choose someone who's like us, someone who was with Jesus practically from the day when he was baptized by John. Well, that narrows the field. Two candidates immediately jumped to mind, Justice and Matthias. Well, which one? We don't know what skill set they need because we don't know what's coming. I tell you what, let's, let's let God decide. We'll throw lots. Matthias, you're it. I'm just saying that they're doing the best that they can. I mean, sometimes the church gets discredited for these kind of make-do decisions, going with what is safe rather than doing something like finding a Paul who may not have traveled with Jesus before his death, but who knows how to witness to the resurrected Christ, to outsiders, to Gentiles, and, and, and help people who've never met Christ before. But Paul won't come until there's greater clarity. This is waiting time, and the earliest church does its best, the best it can while waiting for greater clarity and direction. And why should they be criticized for treading water when they don't even know where to swim? Why should someone who wants to do something different with her life but doesn't know what that is be made to feel bad because she keeps doing the job that she would like to leave? Why should parents feel bad for doing their best as parents even when they doubt their own parenting? Why should those whose faith is shaken, who have doubts, feel bad because they still want to come to church and bow their heads to the God that they are questioning? Why should someone who doesn't even know if her health is going to hold up much longer feel bad for making plans as if she'll be around for her grandchildren for many years yet? Here's the thing. This waiting work carries the earliest church until it is ready to move. I don't know how long the waiting goes, but the next chapter of Acts tells the story of Pentecost. It tells the story of this earliest church finding spiritual clarity and confidence in going about the business of what Jesus told them to do. It begins in the city of Jesus' crucifixion and of their failures, a city that they thought would be most resistant to them. But both citizens of Jerusalem and Jews in town for a harvest festival are called up in the spirit of the movement, and the journey of the gospel begins to the ends of the earth. That's a quite dramatic tale. And I'm not so naive as to suggest that there is always this formula for waiting that will lead to such a dramatic and amazingly good end. What I'm saying, though, is that much of our life is lived without absolute clarity. It's lived in this liminal time. And by that, I mean that much of life can be spent in times of uncertainty that can even seem threatening. In those between times, there... There is confusion as to what to be done, but there is still work to do. 
Sometimes because it needs to be done and sometimes because it carries us. And sometimes God's working in the waiting too. We may not see it, but sometimes a better future begins even though we think that all we're doing is waiting. I've talked about church a lot in this sermon, and I'll stick with form and talk about the church one more time. This church, this congregation. I think in real and powerful ways, our congregation waited well when the future was quite unknown. Back in 2019, this congregation, like many others, played with the idea of rolling out a clear vision 2020 long-range plan in the year 2020. That never happened. The pandemic hit, and this church had to first react and then adapt in response to a threat. We lived through it. You know all that happened. I won't give a long history lesson here. Let me just indulge. Let me just throw out some images just to kind of set the mood. In-person gatherings immediately canceled. Two Sundays of worship broadcast using Jen Brothers' iPhone as a camera. Isolation made worse by a polarizing election. George Floyd's killing. Bible schools online. Elders ordained not by placing hands on their heads, but by raising hands to screens. It's what church does. It was waiting work that needed to be done. Now, we made safe choices at first, distancing, masking, washing while reciting the Apostles' Creed or singing Amazing Grace before we found out that the disease was airborne. Filming choir members scattered throughout this sanctuary so we could have an anthem. Like many churches, we did waiting work. And because of your session and other leaders and teachers, I think we did it well. I, I'm not trying to brag, but, but things happened that we need to be aware of because sadly, some churches and some individuals did not do the waiting work well. Youth suicide rates increased. Some marriages could not take the strain. Some congregations closed. And for many people in churches, isolating led to siloing. What seemed safe at the time was sticking with your own kind and staying that way. But I think this church did its waiting work well. I don't say it much, but I truly believe that God's Spirit was with us when we not only carried on worship and filled vacancies and leadership and carried on what used to be done only online rather than in person. We felt the threat, but I think we faced it. We started asking ourselves, what are the immediate needs? Who's the most vulnerable here? Who needs help? We found ways to check in on each other. And we went to agencies and ministries in the community and asked them what they were seeing and how we could help. We conducted the Mission Bill campaign, which one could say was future-oriented, except it had already been planned before the pandemic, and we were just doing what we already decided to do. Though we couldn't get together to talk about it, we found a way to talk about George Floyd and racism together. All the while, we were waiting for the pandemic to be over. We did the work of worship, fellowship, education, and outreach because it's what needed to be done. It's what churches are supposed to do. It's also what carried us so that we could remain a church together. We did the work because it carried us. And we didn't quite understand at the time that God was working in the waiting too. We changed. We became stronger in some ways. We emerged as more mission-minded and generous. We were protective of the budget because we feared a recession, but the giving went up. And I'm going to tell you, this year's budget, though not yet passed, I can assure you that it will contain a sizable jump in outreach giving. And we ought to be grateful. I'm saying that. Here's what partly why I'm writing this sermon. Millie asked me, Does the church 
know how lucky we are? And so I'm preaching this sermon to make sure you know how lucky we are. If you're not religious, you say you're, we're lucky. If you're religious, you say we're blessed. But we ought to be grateful because I'm telling you, a lot of American congregations did not fare as well. Just to paint with the broadest of strokes, some tried simply to survive and wait till it was over, and now they are weaker, and some died. And then there were those churches that embraced the isolation and polarization as an opportunity for growth and attention. And he, to hear the preaching of their pulpits, you would think that, that they become little chapels, community organizations, and propagandists for progressive or conservative political and social movements. And some of them are self-righteous. And I'd say even a bit mean and gossipy and conspiratorial. I thank God that somehow while doing the waiting work together, we have become even more committed to treasuring our diversity as a church where people who disagree not only share pews, but will work together over at Family Promise in helping build this house for Habitat. Our energy isn't wasted on proving what isn't the truth to begin with, that there is some pristine righteous cause or some righteous movement out there that's going to solve the world's problems and fix what is broken. Instead, we have stuck to seeking the needs beneath the issues and doing the best we can to do something about them. We've shied away from being this billboard church with clever messages but rather be a working church seeking results. So maybe this congregation can be an imperfect and flawed role model when you find yourself between times, times that seem threatening and uncertain. Everyone, you included, want answers and solutions and directions right now. And there are unhealthy ways to live during those times beginning with denial and waiting till it's over. But there are healthy ways to deal with it too. You can pray. Not the avoidance prayers, but the confessing, listening, asking prayers that keep you open to the Spirit. You can study. You can learn. You can be attentive to each other, to your family, to your friends within this community, within the larger community, and you can find ways to help others while you wait for the help that you need. I commend you to this waiting work, being faithful in the work that needs to be done and the work that just simply carries you through, and to be open to the work that God is doing while you're waiting. Second Presbyterian, finding direction by following Jesus.